Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at capillary exchange, a really important concept when it comes to the cardiovascular system, but also when it comes to fluid balance of the body. And understanding this system helps you make a lot of sense of things like edema and also inflammation as well. Let's take a look. So to begin, we need to have a look at the basic circulation of the body. So there's two major circulations, those of the pulmonary circulation of the lungs and that of the systemic circulation. And we know that the right hand side of the heart deals with deoxygenated blood and the left hand side deals with oxygenated blood. As the deoxygenated blood leaves the left hand side, uh, sorry, the right hand side of the heart, it goes to the lungs, gets oxygenated and then goes back to the left hand side of the heart, left atrium, left ventricle. The left ventricle will contract and pump this oxygenated blood filled with nutrients out via the aorta, which will branch multiple times and turn from an artery into smaller muscular arterioles to capillary beds. And it's at these capillary beds that we have exchange occurring. So what I've drawn up here is a capillary bed. And you can see the blood's coming in on this particular side, and this is the arterial end. And then we've got blood leaving on this side and this is going to be the venous end. And in between, what do we have? We've got the capillary bed. And we've got some cells here. So firstly, let's talk about what do we want to exchange with these cells? So there's a couple of things. First thing is, we want to give the cells oxygen, and we want to give the cells nutrients. What do we want to receive from the cells? Well, we want to take from the cells carbon dioxide, which is a waste gas, an exhaust of using oxygen and nutrients, but we also want other various wastes. So this might be urea, creatinine, whatever it may be. So these are the major things that we want to exchange. So as you can see, we don't just want to push things out at the capillary bed, we want to bring things back in. And this is the basic point that we need to understand when it comes to capillary exchange is things are going in two directions. So now let's take a look at this, right? As the left-hand side of the heart contracts and pushes that blood out via the aorta, it's pushing it out at a maximum pushing force, which we call the blood pressure, of 120 millimeters of mercury. Now, as we move through these various pipes, that pressure of 120 millimeters of mercury obviously drops, right? The pressure drops the longer you, or the, basically the longer the pipe, the longer the track. Think about if I had a hose and a tap and I had a 50 meter long hose and I turned it on, it's gonna be at its highest pressure right at the tap. And think about it, as it moves through the hose, it's experiencing resistance. So the blood or the water slows down. So same thing happens here. It goes from 120 millimeters of mercury at the aorta, but by the time it reaches the capillary bed, the blood pressure is around about 30 millimeters of mercury. Now, blood pressure is simply the pushing force that the blood is putting on the walls of the vessels. So up here, you've got 120 millimeters of mercury pushing on the walls of the arteries, and then it drops to maybe 90 at the arterioles. And then when it gets to the capillary bed, the outward pushing force is 30 millimeters of mercury. So let's write this down. You've got this outward pushing force of 30 millimeters of mercury. That's the first thing. Now, we don't call it here blood pressure, right? There's another term and it's called hydrostatic pressure, but basically it's blood pressure. So here we've got the, and let's just write as HP, the hydrostatic pressure in the blood here, in the capillary bed is 30 millimeters of mercury. So what we're doing, we're pushing things out. Now, the things we're pushing out are nutrients and oxygen, and electrolytes and other small things that can fit through the holes of the capillary beds. But the thing is, as we push this stuff out, there are things that remain, things that are too big to move through the, the walls of the capillary beds. What are these things? Well, they're things like white blood cells. They're things like red blood cells. They're things like proteins. They're things like platelets. So there's a whole bunch of cells and structures and things 
that are too big to move out. Now I want you to think about this. Some of these, like proteins, have a really strong negative charge. Remember, a lot of phosphate associated with proteins, and there's a lot of negative charge associated with them, particularly that of albumin, which is a very common protein within the bloodstream. It's got a negative charge, and what do you know about things with negative charges? They love to pull water towards them. So at the same time as having an outward pushing force from the blood pressure or the hydrostatic pressure, we have an inward pulling force. And the inward pulling force is simply the attractant force that these negative proteins are placing on the water. We call this osmosis, right? So this is called the osmotic pressure. So we've also got an inward pulling force. And this inward pulling force is not 30 millimeters of mercury, it's about 20 millimeters of mercury. And remember, it's the osmotic pressure, sometimes it's called the oncotic pressure, and the oncotic part is referring to proteins. Osmotic is just referring to the pulling of water. Let's just write those two terms down, right? You can have osmotic, or you can say oncotic, but regardless of what the textbook says, that's this pulling force that's happening primarily because proteins are pulling it in. Now have a look, we're still on the arterial end here. What wins, an outward push or an inward pull? If, it's, if you've got 30 people pushing something out, and only 20 people pushing something in, who's gonna win? The 30. And it wins by, what's the difference? 10 millimeters of mercury. So what you're gonna find is on the arterial end, there is a net outward push of 10 millimeters of mercury. And this is important because it's this outward pushing force, so it wins, things go out on the arterial end, nutrients and oxygen. These are the things that go out. Now think about it, the blood's gonna to continue to move through, right? And as the blood continues to move through, what else is continuing to move through? These substances that don't leave, right? Including the proteins, right? So you've got these negative proteins here, but you've also got the cells moving through and so forth. What do you think has happened to this hydrostatic pressure? Do you think it's the same on the venous end? Do you think it's higher or do you think it's lower? Well, what if you had a hose connected to a tap again, 50 meter long hose, but this time you put holes every meter down the hose, holes down the hose, and then turn it on. What do you think is gonna happen? Water's gonna squirt out those holes. But the water closest to the tap will squirt out highest, and then as it gets to the end, it's gonna go lower, 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 because the pressure reduces as you move through. So this hydrostatic pressure drops as we move through from the arterial to the venous end. There's still an outward push, but it's no longer 30 millimeters of mercury. This outward push, this outward push is now 15 millimeters of mercury. It's dropped. What do you think about the inward pulling force, this oncotic or osmotic force? Do you think it's changed, gone up, gone down, or the same? Well, none of these things have left. They've all remained the same. So the inward pulling force is about the same, 20 millimeters of mercury. So now we've got this inward pulling force of 20 millimeters of mercury. Again, the osmotic or oncotic pressure. And again, this was the hydrostatic. Now who wins? Well, the inward pulling force is now winning, right? By five. So now, what do we have? Instead of a net outward push, we've got a net inward pull of five millimeters of mercury. Which means on the venous end, things get pulled back in. What get pulled? What's what, get pull, what gets pulled, if I can speak properly, what gets pulled back in? Carbon dioxide and wastes. That's exactly what we want, right? Now the thing is, there's fluid going out. It's the, these things are dissolved in the fluid. So fluid gets pushed out here, moves through, fluid gets pulled back in, and the fluid continues, right? This plasma. Not all the fluid gets pulled back in. Some fluid will remain out in what we call the interstitium. Interstitium. 
This is the space outside of the blood, outside of the cells, but between the blood and the cells, right? This is the interstitium. So fluid remains in the interstitium. Where does it go? Well, it gets thrown into the lymphatic system. It gets thrown into the lymph, the lymphatic system. But luckily for us, the lymphatic system connects back with the venous system and any of that fluid that wasn't reclaimed gets put back into the venous system. Brilliant. This is the basics of capillary exchange. Now, why would you possibly need to know this? A couple of reasons. First reason is this, inflammation. Inflammation is any time you have damage to vascularized tissue. Damage to vascularized tissue. Hmm. Here's vascular tissue. This is the tissue that needs to be fed. Here's the blood vessel. So if I damage anything here, I'm going to get inflammation. Now, inflammation results in the release of chemicals. And these chemicals include things like prostaglandins, histamine, bradykinin, just to name some of the most common. What these three chemicals do is they vasodilate the incoming blood, so more blood gets in, right? So the hydrostatic pressure, what do you think happens? Goes up. But what they also do is they tell these gaps to get bigger. These gaps now get bigger. Now, what do you think that means? It means that you've got more of a stronger outward pushing force. Now, firstly, why? Why do these chemicals get released in inflammation for this to happen? Because if you've got damage to these cells, and maybe it's some sort of bacteria that's present, right? You need the white blood cells to come out to start attacking it. So what it does, increases the pressure, more white blood cells come in, makes these gaps really big. Why? So that the white blood cells can now leave. Some of these white blood cells turn into these macrophages, right? So these are good eaters, and they're gonna come along and they're gonna ingest the bacteria or the damaged cells or whatever it may be. So this is great inflammation, but it also means that the proteins leak out too. All right, so if the proteins leak out, what do you think that means as we move through to the venous end? Are these proteins there? No. So is there an inward pulling force? No. So what do you think happens? Fluid stays outside of the blood vessel. Fluid accumulates in the interstitium and you get swelling at the tissue. This is edema, swelling at the tissue because of inflammation. Does that make sense? Hopefully. The other important thing is this. What if someone had right side heart failure? Right side heart failure. So here's the heart, right? Here's the right hand side. Let's separate it down. Here's the right hand side of the heart. What if this side of the heart failed to act as a pump? That's what right side heart, heart failure means. So it's supposed to contract and push the blood out of the right ventricle to go to the lungs to get oxygenated. But if that didn't work, it means that it's not contracting very hard. So can the blood leave to go up? Not really, it's really difficult. So it backs up. Instead, that doesn't happen. And it backs up into the atrium, backs up into the venous return, backs up into the venous system, which means the blood backs up from here into the venous system, into the capillary bed, which means the hydrostatic pressure on the venous end goes up let's say back to 30. And what does that mean? It means, again, similar to inflammation, you have a net outward push and fluid accumulates in the tissues of the periphery. So right side heart failure can result in peripheral edema. So hopefully this makes sense. This is capillary exchange and why you need to know it. I'm Dr. Mike. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.